Chapter 1.4c Abelard's Attempt at Conciliation It is not without interest to investigate how scholasticism itself attempted to settle the Universalia dispute how it tried to create an equipoise between the typical opposites which the tertium non dator divided. This attempted settlement was the work of Abelard, that unhappy man who burned with love for Heloise and who paid for his passion with the loss of his manhood. Whoever is acquainted with the life of Abelard will know how intensely his own soul housed those severed opposites whose philosophical reconciliation was for him such a vital issue. De Remusson characterizes Abelard as an eclectic who criticized and rejected every accepted theory concerning the universalia, but who nonetheless freely borrowed from them what was true and tenable. Abelard's writings, so far as they relate to the universalia dispute, are confusing and difficult because the author is constantly engaged in weighing every argument and aspect of the case. It is precisely because he acknowledged no truth in the avowed standpoint but always sought to comprehend and reconcile the contrary view, which is responsible for the fact that he was never once thoroughly understood, even by his own pupils. Some understood him as a nominalist, others as a realist. This misunderstanding is characteristic. It is much easier to think from one definite type, for within it one can remain logical and consistent, than it is to remain consistent with both types, since the intermediate standpoint is lacking. Realism as well as nominalism, if pursued consistently, leads to finality, clarity, and uniformity. But the weighing and adjustment of the opposites leads to confusion and to an unsatisfactory issue for the types, since to neither is the solution completely satisfying. De Remusson has collected from Abelard's writings a whole series of almost contradictory assertions relating to our subject. He exclaims, Faut-il admettre en effet Ce vaste et incohérent ensemble des doctrines dans la tête d'un seul homme. Et la philosophie d'Abelard est-elle le chaos? From nominalism, Abelard takes the truth that the universalia are words, in the sense that they are intellectual conventions expressed by language. Furthermore, he takes from it the truth that a thing in reality is not universal, but always something particular, and that substance in reality is never a universal but an individual fact. From realism, Abelard takes the truth that genera and species are combinations of individual facts and things on the ground of their indubitable similarity. Conceptualism is, for him, the mediatory standpoint. This is to be understood as a function which comprises the individual objects perceived, classifies them into genera and species upon the basis of their similarity, and thus reduces their absolute multiplicity to a relative unity. However unquestionable multiplicity and diversity may be, the existence of similarities, which by means of the concept makes fusion possible, is equally beyond dispute. For whoever is psychologically so adapted as to perceive mainly the similarity of things, the collective or constellating concept is, so to speak, taken for granted. That is, it frankly obtrudes itself with the undeniable actuality of the sense perception. But, for the man who is psychologically so adjusted as to perceive mainly the diversity of things, the similarity of things is not exclusively assumed. What he sees is their difference, which indeed forces itself upon him with just as much actuality as similarity does to the other. It seems as though feeling into the object were the psychological processes which brought the distinctiveness of the object into an especially bright light, and as though abstraction from the object were the process most calculated to blind one's eyes to the actual distinctiveness of individual things in favor of their general similarity, which is the very foundation of the idea. Feeling into and abstraction combined produce that function which underlies the idea of conceptualism. It is founded, therefore, upon the only psychological function which has any real possibility of uniting the divergence between nominalism and realism and bringing them upon a common way. Although the Middle Ages knew how to speak great words of the soul, psychology they had none, which is one of the youngest of all sciences. If at that time a psychology had existed, Abelard would have framed the essay in Anima as his mediatory formula. De Remusson clearly discerned this, for he says, quote, in pure logic, universalia are only terms of a language of convention. In physics, which is more transcendent than experimental, 
which is true ontology, genres and notions are based on the way in which beings are actually produced and constituted. Between pure logic and physics, there is a mediating region, which can be called a psychology. There, Abayard investigates how our concepts are formed and traces this intellectual genealogy of beings, depicted or symbolic, their hierarchy, and their real existence. Close quote. The universalia ante rem and post rem have remained a matter of dispute for every ensuing century, even though they cast aside their scholastic robe and appeared under a new disguise. Fundamentally, it was the old problem. At one time, the attempt at solution inclined towards the realistic side, at another, towards the nominalistic. The scientific character of the 19th century gave the problem a push once more toward the side of nominalism, after the philosophy of the beginning of the 19th century had at first done full justice to realism. But the opposites are no longer so widely sundered as in Abelard's time. We have a psychology, a mediatory science, which alone is capable of uniting idea and thing without doing violence either to the one or the other. This capacity abides in the very nature of psychology, but no one could contend that psychology has hitherto accomplished this task. One must, in this connection, acquiesce in the words of de Remusson, quote, Abelard triumphed, for, despite serious restrictions, that far-sighted critic discovered a region beyond nominalism or the conceptualism that is imputed to him. His mind is indeed where the modern spirit has its origin. He proclaims it, he advances it, he promises it. The light that glimmers on the morning horizon is that of the still unseen star that will illuminate the world. Close quote. If one overlooks the existence of psychological types, as also the contingent circumstance that the truth of the one is the error of the other, then Abelard's labor will mean nothing but one scholastic sophistry the more. But insofar as we recognize the existence of the two types, the effort of Abelard must appear to us as of the greatest importance. He seeks the mediatory standpoint in the sermo, by which he understood not so much a discourse as a formed sentence joined to a definite meaning, a definition, in fact, only requiring additional words for the consolidation of its meaning. He does not speak of verbum, for to nominalism this is nothing more than a vox, a flatus vocus. Indeed, it is the great psychological achievement of both the classical and medieval nominalism that it completely abolished the primitive, magical, or mystical identity of the word with the objective matter of fact. Too completely, indeed, for the type of man who has it in his foundation, not in the foothold offered by things, but in the abstraction of the idea from things. Abelard was too wide in his outlook to have been able to overlook this value of nominalism. For him, the word was indeed a vox, but the statement, or in his language, the sermo, was something more, for it carried with it a solid meaning. It described the common factor, the idea, what in fact has been thought and understood about things. In the sermo, the universal lived, and there alone. It is, therefore, intelligible that Abelard was also counted among the nominalists. Incorrectly, however, for the universal was to him a greater reality than a vox. The expression of his conceptualism must have been difficult enough for Abelard, for he had necessarily to construct it out of contradictions. An epitaph contained in an Oxford manuscript gives us, I think, a searching insight into the paradox of his teaching. Hic docuit voces cum ribus significare, et dosuit voces res significato notare, errores generum correxit ita specierum. Hic genus et species, in sola voce locavit, et genus et species sermones esse notavit. Sic animal nullumque animal genus esse probatur, sic et homo es nullis homo species vocitatur. Insofar as an expression is striven for, that is based in principle upon one standpoint, that is, the intellectual in the case in point, the antagonism can hardly be bridged except by paradox. We must not forget that the radical difference between nominalism and realism is not purely a logical and intellectual distinction, but also a psychological one, which, in the last resort, amounts to a typical difference of psychological attitude to the object as well as to the idea. Whoever is orientated to the idea apprehends and reacts from the angle of vision governed by the idea, but the man who is orientated to the object apprehends and reacts from the standpoint of his sensation. For him, the abstract is of secondary importance, since what must be thought about things seems to him relatively inessential, while with the former it is just the reverse. The man who is orientated to the object is naturally nominalistic, 
The name is Sound and Smoke, insofar as he has not yet learnt to compensate his objective attitude. Should this latter event take place, he will become, if he has the necessary ability, an overnice logician, one who is constantly on the lookout for a meticulousness, a method, and a dullness that can equal his own. The man who is orientated to the idea is naturally logical. That is why, when all is said and done, he can neither understand nor appreciate textbook logic. The development towards the compensation of his type makes him, as we saw in Tertullian, a man of passionate feeling, whose feelings, however, remain within the magic circle of his ideas. But the man who is a logician by compensation remains with his world of ideas within the magic circle of his object. With these reflections, we come to the shaded side of Abelard's thought. His attempt at solution is one-sided. If, in the opposition between nominalism and realism, it were merely a question of logical intellectual arrangement, it would be incomprehensible why no terminal conclusion other than a paradox is possible. But since it is a question of a psychological opposition, a one-sided intellectual formulation must end in paradox. Sicet homo et nullis homo species vocitatur. Thus, both man and not man are called species. The logico-intellectual expression is absolutely incapable, even in the form of the sermo, of providing that mediatory formula which can do justice to the real natures of the two opposing psychological attitudes, for it is wholly derived from the side of the abstract and is completely lacking in the recognition of concrete reality. Every logico-intellectual formulation, however embracing it may be, divests the objective impression of its living and immediate quality. It must do this in order to reach any formulation whatsoever. But, in so doing, just that is lost which to the extroverted attitude seems absolutely essential, namely, the relationship to the real object. No possibility exists, therefore, that we shall find upon the line of either attitude any satisfactory and reconciling formula. And yet man cannot remain in this division, even if his mind could, For this discussion is not merely a matter of remote philosophy, it is the daily repeated problem of the relations of man to himself and to the world. And because this at bottom is the problem at issue, the division cannot be resolved by a discussion of nominalist and realist arguments. For its solution, a third intermediate standpoint is needed. To the essay in intellectu, tangible reality is lacking. To the essay in re, the mind." Idea and thing come together, however, in the psyche of man which holds the balance between them. What would the idea amount to if the psyche did not provide its living value? What would the objective thing be worth if the psyche withheld from it the determining force of the sense impression? What, indeed, is reality if it is not a reality in ourselves, an essay in anima? Living reality is the exclusive product neither of the actual, objective behavior of things nor of the formulated idea. Rather does it come through the gathering up of both in the living psychological process, through the essay in anima. Only through the specific vital activity of the psyche does the sense perception attain that intensity and the idea that effective force, which are the two indispensable constituents of living reality. This peculiar activity of the psyche, which can be explained neither as a reflexive reaction to sense stimuli nor as an executive organ of eternal ideas, is, like every vital process, a perpetually creative act. Each new day reality is created by the psyche. The only expression I can use for this activity is fantasy. Fantasy is just as much feeling as thought. It is intuitive just as much as sensational. There are no psychic functions which in fantasy are not inextricably interrelated with the other psychic functions. At one time it appears primordial, at another as the latest and most daring product of gathered knowledge. Fantasy, therefore, appears to me as the clearest expression of the specific psychic activity. Before everything, it is the creative activity whence issue the solutions to all answerable questions. It is the mother of all possibilities, in which, too, the inner and the outer worlds, like all psychological antitheses, are joined in living union. Fantasy it was, and ever is, which fashions the bridge between the irreconcilable claims of object and subject, of extroversion and introversion. In fantasy alone are both mechanisms united. If Abelard had gone deep enough to recognize the psychological difference between the two standpoints, he would logically have had to enlist fantasy for the formulation of the reconciling expression. But in the world of science, fantasy is just as much taboo as is feeling. If, however, we appreciate the underlying opposition as a psychological one, it will be seen that psychology is not only obliged to recognize the standpoint of feeling, 
it must also acknowledge the intermediate standpoint of fantasy. Here, however, comes the great difficulty. Fantasy, for the most part, is a product of the unconscious. It doubtless includes conscious elements, but nonetheless, it is an especial characteristic of fantasy that it is essentially involuntary and stands inherently opposed to conscious contents. It has this quality in common with the dream, though the latter has, of course, strangeness and spontaneity in a much higher degree. The relation of the individual to his fantasy is very largely conditioned by his relation to the unconscious in general, and this, in its turn, is peculiarly influenced by the spirit of the age. In inverse ratio to the degree of prevailing rationalism, will the individual be more or less disposed to have dealings with the unconscious and its products. The Christian sphere, like every completed religious form, undoubtedly tends to suppress the unconscious in the individual to the fullest limit, thus paralyzing his fantasy activity. In its stead, religion offers stereotyped symbolical ideas which replace the individual unconscious. The symbolical presentations of all religions are stages of unconscious processes in a typical and universally binding form. Religious teaching gives, as it were, conclusive information concerning the last things and the other world of human consciousness. Wherever we can observe a religion at its birth, we see how even the figures of his doctrine flow into the founder as revelations, that is, as concretizations of his unconscious fantasy. The forms arising out of his unconscious are interpreted as universally valid and thus, in a measure, replace the individual fantasies of others. The evangelist Matthew has preserved for us a fragment of this process from the life of Christ. In the story of the temptations, we see how the idea of kingship emerges from the founder's unconscious in the form of the devil, who offers him power over the kingdoms of the earth. Had Christ misunderstood the fantasy and taken it concretely, there would have been one madman the more in the world. But he refused the concretization of his fantasy and entered the world as a king, unto whom the kingdoms of heaven are subject. He was therefore no paranoiac, as indeed the result also proved. The views advanced from time to time from the psychiatric side concerning the morbidity of Christ's psychology are nothing but ludicrous rationalistic twaddle, altogether remote from any sort of comprehension of the meaning of such processes in the history of man. The forms in which Christ presented the content of his unconscious to the world became accepted and interpreted as universally binding. Therewith, all individual fantasy lapsed. It became not only invalid and worthless, but it was actually persecuted as heretical, as the fate of the Gnostic movement and of later heresies testifies. The prophet Jeremiah speaks in a similar sense when he says, from Jeremiah 23, 16-28, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Hearken not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you, they make you vain. They speak a vision of their own heart, and not out of the mouth of the Lord. I have heard what the prophets said, that prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies? Yea, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart, which think to cause my people to forget my name, by their dreams, which they tell every man to his neighbor, as their fathers have forgotten my name through Baal. The prophet that hath a dream, let him tell a dream. And let he that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat? saith the Lord. Close quote. We see also in early Christianity how, for example, the bishops zealously strove to root out the efficacy of the individual unconscious among the monks. The Archbishop Athenaeus of Alexandria, in his biography of St. Anthony, offers us a particularly valuable insight into this activity. In this document, he describes, by way of instruction to his monks, the apparitions and visions, the perils of the soul, which befall those that pray and fast in solitude. He warns them how cleverly the devil disguises himself in order to bring saintly men to their fall. The devil is, of course, the voice of the anchorite's own unconscious, which revolts against the violent suppression of the individual nature. I give a group of exact quotations from this rather inaccessible book. Very clearly they show how the unconscious was systematically suppressed and depreciated. Quote, there is a time when we see no man, and yet the sound of the working of the devils is heard by us, and it is like the singing of a song in a loud voice. And there are times when the words of the scriptures are heard by us, just as if a living man were repeating them. And they are exactly like the words which we should hear if a man were reading the book. And it also happeneth that they, the devils, rouse us up to the night prayer, and incite us to stand upon our feet, 
and they make us to see also the similitudes of monks and the forms of those who mourn, that is, the anchorites. And they draw nigh to us as if they had come from a long journey, and they make lax the understanding of those who are feeble of the soul. And they begin to utter words like unto these, Are we condemned throughout all creation to love places of desolation? Were we not able when we came to our houses to fear God and to do fair deeds? And when they are unable to work their will by means of a scheme of this kind, they cease from this kind of deceit and turn into another and say, How is it possible for thee to live? For thou hast sinned and committed iniquity in many things. Thinkest thou that the Spirit hath not revealed to me what hath been done by thee, or that I know not that thou hast done such and such a thing? If, therefore, a simple brother hear these things, and feel within himself that he hath done evil, as the evil one hath said, and he be not acquainted with his craftiness, his mind will be troubled straight away, and he shall fall into despair and turn backwards. It is then, O my beloved, unnecessary for us to be terrified at these things, and we have need to fear only when the devils multiply the speaking of the things which are true, and then we must rebuke them severely. Therefore, let us be on our guard." We must not then even appear to incline our hearing to their words, even though they be words of truth which they utter. For it would be a disgrace unto us that those who have rebelled against God should become our teachers. And let us, O my brethren, arm ourselves with the armor of righteousness, and let us put on the helmet of redemption, and in the time of contending, let us shoot out from a believing mind spiritual arrows as from a bow which is stretched. For they, the devils, are nothing at all, and even if they were, their strength hath in it nothing which would enable it to resist the might of the cross. St. Anthony relates, quote, Once there appeared unto me a devil of an exceedingly haughty and insolent appearance, and he stood up before me with the tumultuous noise of many people, and he dared to say unto me, I, even I, am the power of God, and I, even I, am the Lord of the worlds. And he said unto me, What dost thou wish me to give thee? Ask, and thou shalt receive. Then I blew a puff of wind at him, and I rebuked him in the name of Christ. And on another occasion, when I was fasting, the crafty one appeared to me in the form of a brother monk, carrying bread, and he began to speak unto me words of counsel, saying, Rise up, and stay thy heart with bread and water, and rest a little from thine excessive labors, for thou art a man, and howsoever greatly thou mayest be exalted, thou art clothed with a mortal body, and thou shouldst fear sickness and tribulations." Then I regarded his words, and I held my peace, and refrained from giving an answer. And I bowed myself down in quietness, and I began to make supplications in prayer. And I said, O Lord, make thou an end of him, even as thou hast been wont to do away with him at all times. And as I concluded my words, he came to an end, and vanished like dust, and went forth from the door like smoke. Now on one occasion Satan approached the house one night, and knocked at the door, and I went out to see who was knocking. And I lifted up mine eyes, and saw the form of an exceedingly tall and strong man. And having asked him, Who art thou? He answered and said unto me, I am Satan. After this I said unto him, What seekest thou? And he answered unto me, Why do the monks and the anchorites and all the other Christians revile me? And why do they at all times heap curses upon me? And having clasped my head firmly in wonder at his mad folly, I said unto him, Wherefore dost thou give them trouble? Then he answered and said unto me, It is not I who trouble them, but it is they who trouble themselves. For there happened to me on a certain occasion that which did happen to me, and had I not cried out to them that I was the enemy, his slaughters would have come to an end for ever. I have therefore no place to dwell in, and not one glittering sword, and not even people who are really subject unto me, for those who are in service to me hold me wholly in contempt." And moreover, I have to keep them in fetters, for they do not cleave to me because they esteem it right to do so, and they are ever ready to escape from me in every place. The Christians have filled the whole world, and behold, even the desert is filled full with their monasteries and habitations. Let them then take good heed to themselves when they heap abuse upon me. Then, wondering at the grace of our Lord, I said unto him, How does it happen that whilst thou hast been a liar on every other occasion, at this present the truth is spoken by thee? And how is it that thou speakest the truth now, when thou art wont to utter lies? It is indeed true that when Christ came unto this world, thou wast brought down to the lowest depths, and that the root of thine error was plucked up from the earth. And when Satan heard the name of Christ, his form vanished, and his words came to an end. Close quote. 
These quotations show how, with the aid of the universal belief, the unconscious of the individual was rejected, notwithstanding the fact that it transparently spoke the truth. There are in the history of the mind a special reasons for this rejection. It does not behoove us at this point to elucidate these reasons further. We must content ourselves with the actual fact that it was suppressed. Speaking psychologically, this suppression consists in a withdrawal of libido, psychic energy. The libido thus acquired promotes the synthesis and development of the conscious attitude, whereby a new conception of the world is gradually built up. The undoubted advantages gained by this process naturally consolidate this attitude. It is, therefore, not surprising that the psychology of our time is characterized by a prevailingly unfavorable attitude toward the unconscious. It is not only intelligible, but absolutely necessary, that all sciences have excluded both the standpoints of feeling and of fantasy. There are sciences for that very reason. But how does it stand with psychology? If it is to be regarded as a science, it must do the same. But will it then do justice to its material? Every science ultimately seeks to formulate and express its material in abstractions. Thus psychology could, and indeed does, lay hold of the processes of feeling, sensation, and fantasy in the form of intellectual abstractions. This treatment certainly establishes the right of the intellectual abstract standpoint, but not the claims of other quite possible psychological points of view. The other possible standpoints can obtain only a bare mention in a scientific psychology. They cannot emerge as the independent principles of a science. Science, under all circumstances, is an affair of the intellect, and the other psychological functions are submitted to it in the form of objects. The intellect is sovereign of the scientific realm, but it is another matter when science steps across into the realm of practical application. The intellect, which was formerly king, is now merely a resource, a scientifically perfected instrument, it is true, but still only an implement, no more the aim itself, but merely a condition. The intellect, and with it science, is now placed at the service of creative power and purpose. Yet this is still psychology, although no longer science. It is a psychology in a wider meaning of the word, a psychological activity of a creative nature, in which creative fantasy is given priority. Instead of using the term creative fantasy, it would be just as true to say that in practical psychology of this kind, the leading role is given to life. For on the one hand, it is undoubtedly fantasy, procreating and productive, which uses science as a resource. But on the other, it is the manifold demands of external reality which prompt the activity of creative fantasy. Science as an end in itself is assuredly a high ideal, but its accomplishment brings about as many ends in themselves as there are sciences and arts. Naturally, this leads to a high differentiation and specialization of the particular functions concerned, but it also leads to their aloofness from the world and from life, and an inevitable multiplication of specialized terrains which gradually lose all connection with each other. The result of this is an impoverishment and stagnation that is not merely confined to the specialized terrains, but also invades the psyche of the man, who is thus differentiated up or reduced down to the specialist level. By this token must science prove her value to life. It is not enough that she be mistress, she must also be the maid. By so doing, she in no way dishonors herself. Although science has already led us to recognize the disproportions and disorders of the psyche, thus deserving our profound respect for her intrinsic intellectual gifts, it is nevertheless a grave mistake to concede her an absolute aim which would incapacitate her for her métier as an instrument of life. For when we approach the province of actual living with the intellect and its science, we realize at once that we are in a confined space that shuts us out from other, equally real provinces of life. We are, therefore, compelled to acknowledge the universality of our ideal as a limitation, and to look around us for a spiritus rector, which from the standpoint and claims of a complete life, can offer us a greater guarantee of psychological universality than the intellect alone can compass. When Faust exclaims, Feeling is everything, he is expressing merely the antithesis to the intellect, and therefore only reaches the other extreme. He does not achieve that totality of life, and of his own psyche in which feeling and thought are joined in a third and higher principle. This higher third, as I have already indicated, can be understood either as a practical goal or as the fantasy which creates the goal. This aim of totality can be recognized neither by the science, whose end is in itself, nor by feeling, which lacks the faculty of vision belonging to thought, 
the one must lend itself as auxiliary to the other, yet the contrast between them is so great that we need a bridge. This bridge is already given us in creative fantasy. It is not born of either, for it is the mother of both. Nay, further, it is pregnant with the child, that final aim which reconciles the opposites. If psychology remains only a science, we do not reach life. We merely serve the absolute aim of science. It leads us, certainly, to a knowledge of the actual state of affairs, but it always resists every other aim but its own. The intellect remains imprisoned in itself, just so long as it does not willingly sacrifice its supremacy through its recognition of the value of other aims. It recoils from the step which takes it out of itself and which denies its universal validity, since from the standpoint of intellect, everything else is nothing but fantasy. But what great thing ever came into existence that was not first fantasy? Just insofar as the intellect rigidly adheres to the absolute aim of science, is it insulated from the springs of life. It interprets fantasy as nothing but a wish dream, wherein is expressed that depreciation of fantasy which for science is both welcome and necessary. It is inevitable that science should be regarded as an absolute aim so long as the development of science is the sole question at issue. But this at once becomes an evil when it is a question of life itself demanding development. Thus it was an historical necessity in the Christian process of culture that unfettered fantasy activity should be kept under. And, similarly, though for different reasons, it was also a necessity that fantasy should be suppressed in our age of natural science. It must not be forgotten that creative fantasy, if not restrained within just bounds, can also degenerate into a most pernicious luxuriance. But these bounds are never those artificial limitations set by the intellect or by reasonable feeling. They are boundaries governed by necessity and incontestable reality. The tasks of every age differ, and it is only in retrospect that we can discern with certainty what had to be and what should not have been. In the momentary present, the conflict of convictions always predominates, for war is the father of all. History alone decides. Truth is not eternal, it is a program. The more eternal a truth, the more it is lifeless and worthless. It tells us nothing more, because it is self-evident. How fantasy is assessed by psychology, so long as this remains merely a science, is beautifully exemplified in the well-known views of Freud and of Adler. The Freudian interpretation reduces it to causal, primitive, instinctive processes. Adler's conception reduces it to the final, elementary aims of the self. The former is an instinctive psychology, the latter an ego psychology. Instinct is an impersonal biological phenomenon. A psychology which is founded upon instinct must by its nature neglect the ego, since the ego owes its existence to the principium individuatonis, that is, to individual differentiation whose sporadic and individual character at once removes it from the category of general biological phenomena. Although general biological instinct forces make the molding of personality possible, individuality is nevertheless essentially different from general instincts. Indeed, it stands in the most direct opposition to them, just as the individual is as a personality always distinct from the collective. Its essence consists precisely in this distinction. What every ego psychology must therefore exclude and ignore is just the collective element that is essential to instinct psychology, for it is describing the very ego process which is differentiated from collective instincts. The characteristic animosity between the representatives of the two standpoints arises from the fact that either standpoint necessarily involves a depreciation and lowering of the other. For so long as the radical difference between instinct and ego psychology is not realized, either side must naturally hold its respective theory to be universally valid. This does not mean to say that instinct psychology, for example, could not put up a theory of the ego process. It can do so very ably, but in a form and manner which to the ego psychologist looks too much like the negative of his theory. Hence we find that with Freud, the ego instincts do indeed occasionally emerge, but in the main they support a very modest existence. With Adler, on the other hand, it would seem as though sexuality were the merest vehicle, which in one way or another serves the elementary aims of power. The Adlerian principle is the safeguarding of personal power, which is superimposed upon the general instincts. With Freud, it is the instinct that makes the ego serve its purposes, so that the ego appears as a mere function of instinct. Within both types, the scientific tendency prevails to reduce everything to its own principle, from which their deductions again proceed. With fantasies, this operation is accomplished with particular ease, since these, unlike the functions of conscience, which are adapted to reality and have therefore an objectively oriented character, express both instinctive as well as ego tendencies.
It is not difficult for the man who adopts the standpoint of instinct to discover in them the wish fulfillment and the infantile wish and repressed sexuality. But the man who judges from the standpoint of the ego can just as easily discover those elementary aims concerned with the safeguarding and differentiation of the ego, since fantasies are intermediary products between the ego and the general instinct. They accordingly contain elements of both sides. Interpretation from either side is always, therefore, somewhat forced and arbitrary, because one character is always suppressed. Nevertheless, a demonstrable truth does on the whole appear, but it is only a partial truth, which can make no claim to general validity. Its validity extends just so far as the range of its principle, but in the province of other principles it is invalid. The Freudian psychology is characterized by one central idea, namely the repression of incomparable wish tendencies. Man appears as a bundle of wishes which are only partially adaptable to the object. His neurotic difficulties consist in the fact that milieu influences, educational and objective conditions, are a considerable check upon a free expression of instinct. Influences are derived from father and mother, either morally hindering or infantile, which tend to produce fixations that compromise later life. The original instinctive constitution is an unalterable quantity which suffers disturbing modifications mainly through objective influences. Hence, the most untrammeled possible expression of instinct towards the suitably chosen object would appear to be the needful remedy. Conversely, Adler's psychology is characterized by the central idea of ego superiority. The individual appears preeminently as an ego point which must under no circumstances be subjected to the object. While with Freud the craving for the object, the fixation to the object, and the impossible nature of certain desires toward the object play an important role, with Adler everything aims at the superiority of the subject. Freud's repression of instinct toward the object becomes with Adler the safeguarding of the subject. With him the healing remedy is the removal of the isolating safeguard. With Freud it is the removal of the repression that renders the object inaccessible. Hence with Freud the basic formula is sexuality which expresses the strongest relation between subject and object. With Adler, it is that power of the subject which most effectively ensures him against the object and gives to the subject an unassailable isolation which amputates every relation. Freud would vouchsafe the instincts an unfettered excursion toward their objects, but Adler would break through the inimicable spell of the object in order to deliver the ego from suffocation in its own defensive armor. The former view must therefore be essentially extroverted, while the latter is introverted. The extroverted theory holds good for the extroverted type, while the introverted theory is valid only for the introverted type. Insofar as the pure type is a quite one-sided product of development, it is also necessarily unbalanced. Overemphasis upon the one function is synonymous with repression of the other. Psychoanalysis fails to resolve this repression just insofar as the particular method applied is oriented according to the theory of its own type. Thus, the extrovert, in accordance with his theory, will reduce his fantasies as they emerge from the unconscious to their instinct content. But the introvert will reduce them to his power tendency. The gain accruing from such analysis goes to the already existing predominance. This kind of analysis, therefore, merely intensifies the already existing type, and by such means no mutual understanding or mediation between the types is made possible. On the contrary, the gap is widened, both without and within. An inner dissociation arises because fragments of other functions, occasionally arising to the surface in unconscious fantasies, dreams, and so forth, are depreciated and again repressed. On these grounds, a certain critic was in a measure justified when he described Freud's as a neurotic theory but the truth of the statement cannot justify a certain malevolence in expression which only serves to absolve one from the duty of serious concentration upon the problems raised. The standpoints both of Freud and of Adler are equally one-sided and are, therefore, characteristic of only one type. Both theories reject the principle of imagination, since they reduce fantasies and treat them as merely semiotic expression, but in reality, fantasies mean more than that, for they represent also the other mechanism. Thus, with the introverted type, they represent repressed extroversion, and with the extroverted, repressed introversion. But the repressed function is unconscious, hence undeveloped, embryonic, and archaic. In this condition, it is not to be reconciled with the higher nouveau of the conscious function. The inacceptable nature of fantasy is principally derived from this peculiarity of the unrecognized function root.
imagination, for everyone to whom adaptation to external reality is the leading principle, is for these reasons something objectionable and useless. And yet we know that every good idea and all creative work is the offspring of the imagination, and has its source in what one is pleased to term infantile fantasy. It is not the artist alone, but every creative individual whatsoever, who owes all that is greatest in his life to fantasy. The dynamic principle of fantasy is play, which belongs also to the child, and as such it appears to be inconsistent with the principle of serious work. But without this playing with fantasy, no creative work has ever yet come to birth. The debt we owe to the play of imagination is incalculable. It is therefore short-sighted to treat fantasy, on account of its daring or inacceptable character, as of small account. It must not be forgotten that it is just in the imagination that the most valuable promise of a man may lie. I say may advisedly, because on the other hand fantasies are also valueless, since in the form of raw material they possess no sort of realizable worth. In order to unearth the valuable treasure they contain, a development is needed. But this development is not achieved by a simple analysis of the fantasy material. A synthetic treatment is also needed by means of a constructive method. It remains an open question whether the opposition between the two standpoints can ever be satisfactorily adjusted intellectually. Although in one sense, Abelard's attempt must be profoundly respected, yet practically no consequences worth mentioning have matured from it, for he was able to establish no mediatory psychological function beyond conceptualism or sermonism, which is merely a revised edition, altogether one-sided and intellectual, of the ancient Logos conception. The Logos, as a mediator, had this advantage over the Sermo, inasmuch as in his human manifestation he also did justice to non-intellectual aspirations. I cannot, however, rid myself of the impression that Abelard's brilliant mind, which so fully grasped the great yea and nay, would never have remained satisfied with his paradoxical conceptualism, thus renouncing all claim to creative effort, if the impelling force of passion had not been lost to him through the tragedy of fate. In confirmation of this idea, we need only compare conceptualism with the way in which the great Chinese philosophers Lao Tse and Chong Tzu, as also the poet Schiller, confronted this problem. End of section 8. Recording by Olivia.